Welcome everybody to the Sustainable Solutions for Zero Hunger by 2030 Summit, a, a vision for animal agriculture, and that's what we all have in common today is some linkage and association with animal agriculture. I'm Jeff Simmons, President and CEO of Elanco Animal Health. On behalf of everyone at Elanco, it is our pleasure to welcome you to today's forum for really a dialogue on how animals can address two of the biggest forces. We had a discussion this morning on this that are on everyone's agenda, which is how do we feed this world with the right calories from hunger to obesity, nourishing this world. And we can do an awful lot on this, even moving to net zero by 2030. And at the same time, how we cool this climate, how we play a role with animals in actually impacting this climate. We have a large number of constituents all over the globe, across all species groups and all major geographies that will play a role in this discussion today. And ultimately, our challenge is simply this. Let's make this the decade of opportunity for animal agriculture. Let's let this be the decade. We've had a lot of decades of opportunity and challenges that we've taken, but how do we feed the world and cool the climate? Meat, milk, eggs, and fish. That's the challenge. And I think this is especially important in light of next week's United Nations Food System Summit. So we look forward to a robust dialogue today. We thank you for your participation. And I look forward now to introducing Sarah Wyatt, uh, our partners here at AgriPulse. Sarah, over to you. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, it is really a pleasure to partner with you and the folks at Elanco Animal Health on this very, very important topic. So I'd like to kick off today just with a few housekeeping items before we go into our formal program. First of all, we do expect a very lively discussion on the, all these topics. And so please feel free to check out our platform a little bit as we start. Uh, for example, what I'd like you to do as a participant here is to go to the chat function on this Zoom site and tell us where you're from. Uh, I know that when registrations were coming in, we saw people from literally all around the globe that were uh, signing up for this event, from Ireland, from uh, Great Britain, from Australia. Um, I see some coming in from Kansas and Indiana. Uh, so across the U.S. as well as all around the globe. Thank you for joining us. It's great to see. I see a few Canada, uh, Brazil. That's just super. Thank you. I know they're going to keep rolling in so we can see where you're all from. Uh, as we go ahead and um, engage in this dialogue, we also are going to welcome your questions. So please enter those in the Q&A function of the platform. We'll be gathering your questions throughout the day. As a reminder, this event is being recorded and you can find it probably tomorrow on the AgriPulse website, that's agri-pulse.com, as well as the Elanco site. And if you'd like to share this conversation <clears throat> on social media, please use the hashtag, animals are the answer. You can also follow us at AgriPulse, all one word on Twitter, and Jeff Simmons 2050. Now, one more question before I start with some of my opening comments. As you think about the biggest challenges to address zero hunger, please enter one, just one word that comes to mind when you think about the biggest challenges to addressing global hunger. I've seen we've got a couple of folks who are putting some comments in, everything from policy, poverty, innovation, regulations. It's interesting. Thank you so much. So as we, so many of you know, Zero Hunger by 2030 is one of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals established by the United Nations in 2015. It's part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Global citizens are making progress, but not fast enough or with enough scale to meet many of the goals, certainly by 2030. As we look at this, we see a lot of disruptions, certainly due to COVID and to more recently displacements related to Afghanistan. 
there's a lot of complexity to the challenges as many of our participants are filling our chat box with now. In July, the United Nations reported a dramatic worsening of world hunger in 2020, and a multi-agency report estimates that around a tenth of the global population, almost 811 million people, were undernourished last year. That's a staggering amount, and it looks like it's going to get worse. Just yesterday, top United Nations officials warned that millions of people in Afghanistan could run out of food before the arrival of winter, and one million children could die if their immediate needs are not met. Now, the good news is that there are innovative and sustainable solutions to addressing this monumental hunger challenge, and today we're going to focus on how animal agriculture fits into the picture. Please keep in mind that my company, which provides the leading farm, food, and rural policy content in the U.S., we cover all types of agriculture. We've written about plant-based protein, cell-cultured protein, organic, sustainable, regenerative, and on and on. We strive to provide balanced reporting and trusted insights and have bias towards none. However, we also know that developing new solutions is not easy. As someone who grew up on a farm and now owns a farm, I know how important it is to focus on the complex relationships between the science, the technology, and the economics behind food systems. There is no one size fits all solution that works for all different types of climates, typographies, and soil types. So there are solutions we can point to today with even more promise on the horizon. And that's why it's exciting, especially for those millions of hungry children, teenagers, and adults who urgently need our help. We wanna be able to watch the innovative work being done to make livestock production more sustainable. And we're finding ways to produce the highest quality protein with fewer resources in ways that can lift up even the smallest, most disadvantaged stakeholder farmers that help them feed their families. Now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Jeff Simmons back to our virtual stage for some additional opening comments. Jeff? Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Sarah. I appreciate this very much. So let me just try to put a little context um, to today and what we're trying to get done to everyone around the world. We've got over 600 participants. We have what I've heard is close to 40% of the global protein, animal protein represented. So most every major continent is represented, every major species and every major country. And a lot of people say, why, why Elanco, are you doing this? And one thing we have that maybe a local association doesn't have is the ability actually to, um, to, to cross species, cross borders. And we've heard clearly from all of you that, hey, this, this, is, this is our decade's opportunity, but this is also our decade's challenge. How do we feed this world and cool the planet? So maybe just a little context to set things up. We had a chance to meet as CEOs this morning um, from a lot of companies had and started the dialogue. <clears throat> what I will tell you is there's something about recognizing a formality of an event like this where we all come together and we all lean in and say, hey, this is important. Um, it's relevant to the world. Sarah, as we just said, these two forces of feed the world, cool the climate, if these are two of the biggest forces over the next year, nine years, you don't do this without animal protein. It's absolutely critical. 40% of all protein calories come from us. Protein is the fastest moving, fastest growing food segment. And it's the one that's the most dynamic. So most critical to us as we go forward. So I think this is, this is important. So what, what I would like to do is really to say that one, accepting this challenge formally, stating that in a formal way into the United Nations and this key meeting next week, that really catalyzed this meeting is the United Nations getting together and saying, hey, it's not the just removal of livestock. It's not changing diets. It is allowing our industry a seat at the table to be able to show how we can play a critical role in reducing obesity, increasing people's access to protein and hunger while cooling the climate in the next nine years. Candidly, I think our data shows and science shows 
the only way to do this is by um, by 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 methane, and and we have a bigger impact on that than anybody else. So you're going to hear from a lot of great people. Our goal is to provoke thought, to create a formal submission of our interest as an industry that we want to be at this table, and then I think a coalition of actions coming out of out of today. That's what we intend to do. I kind of say always as a, as an Elanco, and as I've watched us tackle food safety. I was saying this morning, we took uh, salmonella in the UK and E. coli in the US since 2000 and reduced it by 50%. We've taken animal husbandry and animal well-being and changed practices and really made that much, much less of an issue. We've taken antimicrobial resistance. Some of us in the last seven years played a significant role in changing the trajectory of resistance to antibiotics with our contributions by how we actually brought new innovation changed the way we used antibiotics. So we've done this before. Now we've made public commitments, most companies to be net zero by 2030, 2040, 2050. So here's a graphic that I'd like to put up, a graphic to kind of get us all to visualize and understand what I believe is critical. Bubble one is really the number 30%. And this is really important and it hit me with the United Nations meeting. For the first time, they connected calories and climate you can't disconnect them. They're part of their, their goals that they have. So to get to net zero hunger um, and net zero climate, you got to step back and really look at this. One, global nutrition. Today, 30% of the world is not getting enough calories, enough of the right calories. Another 30% is getting wrong calories. That's the epidemic of obesity that we have in the world. So we have a nutrition problem. And protein, we know, plays an absolute critical role. Let me stop in this first bubble and just give you a sense. FAO claims that the 60 million metric tons of our industry is going to 90 million metric tons, driven primarily by GDP. That doesn't also include the Western diet of less carbs and more protein. And so when you step back and say, well, what about the alternative protein industry? That's a $1 billion industry. We're a $90 billion industry. We're growing significantly. We will not eat our way out of this by changing diets because taste, cost, and nutrition always prevail and animal protein is winning. We've consumed more animal protein in the last two years than any two years in the history of man. And we still have, Dr. Kilbada, you'll hear from today, two thirds of Africa not getting even close to the animal protein they need. So that's one force, but it's an and and is cooling the climate. I won't get into a lot of detail here. I'm not an environmentalist, but I will say, as we all know, there's two gases. We'll talk about these, carbon and methane that make up greenhouse gases. Methane is that short-lived flow gas that lasts you know, nine to 12 years. And actually by impacting that, which we can do more than any other industry, we can cool this climate by reducing methane by one third over the next nine years we can move to cooling this climate. Animals cannot be left from the table when it comes to cooling the climate. The third bubble that I'll be a little provocative is I believe there's economic opportunity. The only way you move this quickly and solve challenges coming after a pandemic like COVID in nine years is quite simply one way, private industry. And as we heard just by the Senator, it's by also making sure that sustainability has to have profit in the center of it. So this is absolutely critical. And we believe that as you look at emissions, each one of our sectors, each one of the lanes of how to reduce it from land in the animal, out of the animal, what we'll tell you is we have an opportunity to create a minimum of another 25% of economic opportunity to our $90 billion industry. And I think that's conservative as we look at it. So there is, there is economic opportunity, which I believe can even be looked at in a way that will drive the speed necessary to achieve these goals. So ultimately our challenge is animals. Animals, this can be our decade of opportunity. We can take on this challenge like we have others. Animals can feed the world and cool the climate and also create the next era of opportunity economically and from an innovation perspective. So we'll, we'll continue to anchor on this. You can be assured that we will, uh, throughout this afternoon, be listening 
and be looking at how this does not become an event, but this becomes a catalyst to drive a movement. Starting with next Thursday, us having a clear submission into that key United Nations meeting on the role that we will play. An offensive move, not a defensive move. So with that, I look forward to a lot of engagement. Sarah, I think we're gonna have a brief discussion here, so I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jeff. I would like to drill down into some of your comments just a little bit more. You know, it's very easy for a lot of folks to point as to animals as being a big part of the problem with yeah. climate change. But tell us a little bit more just about how you see animals being part of that solution and addressing the methane issue. Well, first I start with the diet. I think like all of us, we hear about, uh, whether it's the Impossible Burger, or we hear about uh, lots of noise. <laughs> And, and what I would emphasize is, look, step back and realize that we are part of the fastest growing. I have a few uh, consumer product good people on my uh, board, and they constantly remind me to say, you know, meat, milk, eggs, and fish globally is the, is the hottest food segment in, in the world right now. And all trends line up to say, one, GDP. As GDP grows, this grows. And there's a lot of the world that's still not getting the nutrition. So one is economics are on our side. I think two, as you look at, you know, just, just diet preference, the power of taste, cost, and nutrition constantly prevails in every survey. So going, you know, the last two years, whether it's in the U.S. and the chicken sandwich craze or Asia, as they had to change diets because of African swine fever, we've seen animal protein persist through every headwind. The Impossible Burger and plant diet, I'm not knocking that at all, but putting it in context, it's fallen off a lot of menus. It's a $1 billion, not a $90 billion industry. So this, this is a rocket. The world wants what we have. The planet needs what we can provide, which goes to the other side, Sarah, which is this. Methane is actually, and you're going to hear from some producers, methane is that short-lasting gas that actually, not, not carbon, and reducing methane is something we can do, primarily in the cattle business. But by doing that, we actually can have one of the biggest impacts on cooling this climate. And there's a lot of people that are already doing it now. Um, I visited um, one of the speakers you're going to hear from today, a dairy operation that has seen economic benefit as much from the environment than the milk that they produce. It's an inventor. It's a futurist, but it's already being done. Net zero already exists today, and strong economics from this already exists. The problem is we need to get on offense, not defense, because the world needs what we have more than ever. Tell us a little bit about your session this morning with the CEOs that you convened. What did you hear? Uh, what do you think are the, uh, the outcomes from that that you can share? You know, I think first is making sure we don't make this too complicated. Uh, everything that we tie back to animal agriculture is not easy. <laughs> we we got to count on this plant-based. I think one of the things when you look at, you know, maybe if you're you're out there in poultry and in pigs and in aqua, you say, well, hey, I don't I don't produce the methane and have the issues. Well, the opportunity. What I heard this morning, Sarah, is it's a lot about the land. We all have feed. Feed. You're going to hear from key experts this afternoon that the you know partnering with the, the feed industry and what happens on the land is critical. We, we consume a lot of feed and that feed creates a lot of footprint. So how we collaborate there. That was one key thing I think we heard is we all have a role in this. And we all can change the footprint. I think the other is just not keeping it complicated is really there's four avenues to reduce this. You know, it's on the land, in the animal, out of the animal, and then in the value chain. Now we got five species. You're gonna see a chart today that shows the five species and those four categories. All of us have a node of opportunity, no matter what geography and what species, where we can reduce emissions, we can create economic opportunity, and we can create a whole lot more brand for our business. I think that's, that's the other thing. I think the other I heard very clearly from a lot of branded companies, this is a big deal for consumers. We in Elanco con conducted research, Sarah, people that have started to reduce their consumption of meat, surprisingly more than half, it was because of the environmental footprint perception from animal production, not what it was doing to their diet. So I think we have to do this because this next generation is demanding it. 
or that nice trajectory the FAO has, the force of meat, milk, and eggs, that trajectory line could change. It is at risk if we don't address the environment piece. So those are the things that, you know, and I think data and benchmarking is everything. Uh, you know, until we know our benchmark and we can't measure it, then we can't put the science against it to change the trajectory. Those are, those are things that I heard. But loud and clear, everyone wants a seat at this table. I, I noticed there was a meekness at food safety. There was a meekness with AMR that, hey, we got to be careful. There's a political correctness piece. I don't sense that at all. Candidly, most all the companies today have made already made commitments. So this is about going to do it. All about implementation. Yeah. So one of the things that we asked at the start of this session was for folks to enter in the chat what they saw as one word capsulizing their, their, the challenges that they see in addressing this global hunger challenge. Uh, what did you hear from the, your fellow CEOs about what they see as the big challenges out there? Is it perception? Is it the you know, need for more innovation? Or what, what sorts of words were coming up? Yeah, I think, I think a few things. There's no question of communication. We had Richard Edelman from the Edelman Group. Uh, some of you know Edelman is a global communication PR firm that has helped uh, put proper science and narrative to the public and the consumer. And, you know, Richard shared very openly, you got to start with a consumer in mind here. You got to show progress and you got to, you know, got to get it a message that can be understood. Um, we heard from a couple of branded companies that, yes, we, this, this is a communication challenge, but that can't be used as a fault. What we heard was really this measurement and innovation and communication is key, but we all need to get measurement and a roadmap behind these commitments we're making and we need to get started. So if, you know, a lot of people have made commitments, but we haven't gotten started on the roadmaps. And if we don't have roadmaps and milestones, I think Jason Clay said it very well today, then we don't have stories. And if you don't have stories, things start to fall down. So you're going to hear about a few stories today as a way to see the future of people that have already maybe gotten to the future so that we can start building our roadmaps with belief that we can actually do this. I think that's another piece. The other is policy. We, we can't be regulated and required. We have to let opportunity and capitalism and, and what we see as opportunity here to where we can build something sustainable. If there's not economic opportunity and capturing these carbon credits and ways to systemize it into our economics and our p and I'm sorry, it won't move. This can't be regulated upon us. This has to be, and that's why we got to move now. We have to move. My word would be kind of a, 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 a combined of two words, but it's no regrets. Uh, I, think, I think in 18 months, we'll either have regrets or we'll have no regrets. And hopefully today's a catalyst for what do you see as the potential outcome from the UN Food Systems Summit? You're talking about moving now and trying to make sure that you have a voice and collectively a much louder microphone with all the other folks that you're partnering with. What do you see as potential outcomes from the UN Food Systems where right now, uh, I hear a lot of folks are very, very concerned and especially concerned about how animal agriculture might be treated. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I, here's one of the outcomes I want. I hope we're a little disruptive. As I've shared with Dr. Kilbada, we're, we're the only industry I know of that's bringing together 40 to 50% of our global industry because we weren't really invited to the party to say, look, we, we, we want to be at this table. So one is, I think, um, engaging with them both and, and their offices very actively before this meeting. And then leaning in um, with a statement going into the meeting, I ask every participant to, to, to look over the, the, the brief, I think very generic high level statement saying animals matter. We wanna play a role in nutrition in the planet. We need as many on that statement. Um, I think those things are powerful, but we need to be a little number one outcome is animals were a little disrupted before the meeting and were included coming out of the meeting. Uh, that's, that's number one. Two is, let us look at this. I thought it was said very well by Mike Mokowski this morning directly to the UN. Let us be part of the solution. And the solution cannot be a change of diets. That doesn't work. That's not, that's not how the world works. Let us use innovation and give the challenge back to us. From the land to the animal, we can, we can cool this climate in nine years. 
we take on that challenge. Let us be part of that challenge. Don't try to take us out with regulatory or rules or costs or trying to change diets. That does not make sense. I think that's, we need that agenda to become the post-meeting agenda. And it won't be necessarily a careful one, but it's an absolutely prudent and right one. And the one thing I heard from Dr. Kilbada, and I think you'll hear from it today, is when posed the question, what's critical when it gets confusing? I asked her your question, Sarah, and the question that she came back to, I think you'll hear from it today, is science. Couldn't have asked for a better answer. Science and facts and nutrition and economics and environmentalists, all of those data points line up on our side. Yes, we're definitely looking forward to hearing from her later in our program. I know one of the things that um, has often come up as well is that when people think about environmental impact of animal agriculture, they sometimes forget environmental benefits. For example, I was reading something the other day about uh, some African women who have come together in a cooperative fashion and been able to capture the manure and uh, they were calling it green gold and not only use that to enhance yields, but also to generate renewable energy. So how do we get all the benefits of animals as uh, recyclers uh, out into the public information as well? Yeah, I think I was part of a dialogue yesterday, really great. I think we, we need to make sure we don't get this too complicated, right? And, and it doesn't look you know, self-serving. It has to be real and it has to be one. We have to just do what we always do first, just like the antibiotics or food safety, get the science right, get the husbandry right, do our thing really well, get the fundamentals right. Then we start capturing the data. Then we tell our story. And I think that's, we got to do that a little bit in parallel right now, Sarah. But, you know, I think one construct that I do very clearly is, look, on the land, we know there's no till, there's other things. There's the sequestering of those credits that come off from that land piece. In the animal, a lot going on. This is our space. You know, how do you reduce methane and ammonia? How do you create more protein in the animal and, and, and create less, you know, um, let, let, let less output that is that is impacting the environment. But when we do get that output, the third channel is what do we do with that? You're going to hear stories today from water credits to uh, and, and doing things with water to the manure. Uh, I think there's people challenging. I heard for the first time this morning, the cow-calf operation, yes, is 60, 70 percent of the beef footprint. But there's cow-calf people that are determined with feed yard people to collaborate and figure that out. And then how we how we take the in the value chain with the you know, phase one, phase two, kind of looking at, at, at the credits as well as the energy cost. So I think it's, it's keeping this simple and then turning around and telling the story. And then there's the bigger things, right? Like you say, 60% of the agricultural land out there that's not usable, animals turn that unusable land into protein by grazing. And, the, and that's, that's a big part of smallholder farming and international agriculture. So Jeff, for a long time, we've been uh, accused in agriculture as, as not doing a good enough job of telling our stories. And uh, you certainly hit on that a little earlier in your comments about how we have to do a better job communicating. I certainly hope that our participants are using their social media skills and, and, and uh, helping us amplify this conversation. And in addition, that they will be also trying to think of some of the things that they can do to be better communicators. Can you share some thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that's one good prevailing question for this afternoon because everybody has their way. But I, I believe that we must be credible. We must make sure and do the obvious things like we've always done that uh, we must, you know, keep it simple. <laughs> we must get key opinion leaders and the right platforms and be on the right platforms with the most credible voice that, uh, you know, can, can tell the story from the, the source that's most credible. But I, I think, Sarah, my biggest worry always is we are in an environment where, you know, big public companies, where we got to be politically correct. We got to be careful. Uh, we got to make sure this is pre-competitive. That was a big part of the discussion this morning that, you know, because we're a consolidated industry, we need to make sure that very, you know, carefully that this is a platform of opportunity for the world to do a better thing. 
and it's pre-competitive. All of these things though, create caution. They create divide. They create flights, not fight, where we go back into our corners. We don't have that opportunity here. And in nine years, that means in 18 months to three years, this agenda has been written. So my number one thing on telling the story is have the courage to be willing to step in. Who's on the COP26 platform? Who's going to be on CNN? Who's going to go meet and sit down with Larry Fink at BlackRock on ESG and talk about the beef industry's role in cooling the climate because of methane? Who's going to the regulatory bodies to bring the next innovation? Because we know that there's innovation that can, in the ruminant of a cow, reduce methane. So to me, it starts with courage, and then it's the right platforms with the most credible parties, with a emotive message, that emotive being driven by who the audience is in a way that it's understood. And then as you know, Sarah, better than me, it's over and over and over. This is a nine-year communication campaign and we will win it. Why? Science, facts, economics, consumer purchasing. Everyone can talk about consumer. No, consumers have already voted the last two years. They love what we have. We just need to do a better job. And they will love it even more if we show them that we can help the environment. So data is on our side. We just got to be careful that we don't get so cautious. We miss this window. Well, that sounds like a, a really strong uh, enticement for people to jump in and be involved in this conversation and, and hopefully have that courage that you're referring to, to, to be the ones that will uh, amplify the voices of those representing this industry. Um, Jeff, just as we get close to our close here, I'd like to have you make any closing comments that you'd like before um, introducing our next speaker, because I know that uh, you had a lot of engagement with Agnes Kilbada, and um, I, I can't wait to see her comments as well. So I'll let you wrap up and uh, look forward to visiting with you a little later. Yeah, so, you know, I, I would say there's there's three important days, I always say, in your uh, life. <laughs> there's, you know, the day that, uh, not, not the day you're born, but I always say that I did this in an FFA convention a while ago. There's the day that uh, you, uh, you find out why you do what you do. You know, Simon Sinek, why is more important than what and how. I know so many people out here today. You love what you do. You believe meat, milk, and eggs, and fish. And you, this is not an easy industry. But you do it because you know this is, it's purposeful. The second most important day is the day that you, you know, lean in and say, I'm going to do something about it. All of you have built companies and NGOs, and you've helped shape policy and create regulatory laws or develop an innovation. And that's acting on your why. But you know, there's a third day my dad always used to say was most important is the day that when it's all over, you don't have any regret. And I, I will tell you, my Twitter handle is 2050. And I'm not projecting my last day or anything, but I'm saying at 2050, there is a food secure world, eating a whole lot of animal protein. It's not obese. It's getting good nutrition. It has great cognitive skills. We're going to cool the planet and we're going to have an amazing industry we're proud of. But I'm concerned that a mile marker to 2050 is 2030. And I just challenge all of us, we can't have regret here. We are truly at a point in time now where we have to step up. And you know, don't leave this meeting saying, well, I didn't see the action plan. Please have a piece of paper in front of you starting to know it. I wish we were all in one room all together, but we can't be. But have a piece of paper in front of you saying to yourself, what is next? And how important is that? Where are we? And what, what's my role? And I'd write on the top of that piece of paper, no regrets, because the world needs us more than they realize they do. And we know we can step up to this. We've had bigger challenges before. So thank you. Uh, please see this is not anything to do with Elanco. This is, I'm just one colleague talking to another here relative to something we're really proud of, what we do. And that's meat, milk, eggs, fish, putting it in the center of a table, and we're going to cool the climate while we do it. That's our vision feed the world, cool the climate, create the next era of economic opportunity. That's the vision.